You're sitting at a stoplight, getting ready for the light to change, and a little blue Mustang pulls up right beside you. You look over, and it's Jesus. Oh, and he doesn't look anything like you expect. He's not tall and thin and gaunt and mystical. He doesn't have long, flowing, chestnut brown hair. No, he's just a regular looking guy. In fact, he looks like he's just a blue collar worker, any, any guy that you might see on a construction site somewhere. And he's going like this to you. So you roll down your window and he says, Hey, whatever you got going today, blow it off and follow me. I got something to show you. With that, the light changes. Off he goes. What do you do? What do you do? Kind of an odd moment because in some ways this is exactly what it was like the day that the disciples were doing their fishing thing and they were on the boats and they were bringing in all of the different fish and hanging and then suddenly Jesus walks by the shore and he says, hey, follow me. And they drop everything and follow him. I mean, we all know that as a Sunday school story if you grew up in church and it's like, oh yeah, that's the way it worked. But you think about that as a real life situation. It's like, yeah, you know, things aren't really that simple. Turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to take a look at this cultural equivalent of Jesus pulling up next to you at a stoplight and telling you to blow off everything and follow him. In Mark chapter 1, if you're going to use one of those brown Bibles we have, and I don't know where they are, but they're all over the tables and things, use one. It'll be page 744 on one of those. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14, it says, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. He had gone a little farther, and he saw James and uh, the son of Zebedee and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. And without delay he called them, And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Let's pray. Lord, as we open your word today, I pray that your spirit would move through these words into our heart and into our mind. And that you would challenge us in our lives with areas, Lord, that we have grown complacent. Or areas that we are just blind and we don't see and we haven't thought about. May you spur us on to love and good deeds through the power of your word. And may we ever draw closer to you and to your heartbeat and know who you are. Speak today through your word, Lord. I ask in your name. Amen. Interesting, because this whole idea of come follow me isn't exactly what we think. I don't know, when I was a kid, I kind of pictured it like Jesus walking by the shore, you know, and and he would just walk by the sand and say, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And the disciples just sort of dropping the nets and going, yes, Lord, right? (laughs) And this whole kind of weird feel, it just, it didn't feel real and natural. It didn't feel, I just didn't quite grasp it. And I thought, well, they know something or Jesus knew something. Something was going on there that was weird. But really, that's not what's happening. You look at the story and these guys are getting ready to go out fishing. That's what they do for a living. That's their daily job. That's their grind. That's what they do. And right getting ready to start their day to make the money that they need to make to supply the home life that they're trying to support. Jesus comes along and says, hey, what you're going to do today? Just drop it all and come follow me instead. And they do. Which is, I think, amazing. And I start looking at this. It's interesting because in the Gospel of Mark, five times Jesus calls people to follow him. Eleven times he tells people to go away. I don't know what that means, but I think it's interesting. But when you read the whole story together, this actually is not the first time these guys meet Jesus. It isn't their first encounter with him. And when I was young, I kind of thought that's how it went. Jesus just shows up on the shore, picks a couple strangers out of the boat, says, hey, you follow me. Bam, they drop everything and follow him. And the story starts and they become apostles. But in order to really understand the story, you've got to kind of look at all four Gospels. When the, when the Gospels were written, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're a different eyewitness to the account of the life of Jesus. And each one emphasized something different. When Matthew wrote his Gospel, The early church fathers tell us he actually wrote it in Hebrew, and he was writing to a Jewish audience to prove that Jesus was the rightful king of Israel. That's why there's way more Old Testament quotes in the Gospel of Matthew than in any of the other Gospels. That was his purpose in writing. That was his audience. When Mark wrote his Gospel, he was writing to a Roman audience. He was writing to to, uh, people who didn't think along the biblical lines. You don't see a lot of Old Testament quotes in the Gospel of Mark because those guys didn't know it. And so he was writing to show a lot more power. And, and, he, and the word immediately occurs multiple times in the Gospel of Mark that you don't see it occurring in the other Gospels. He was trying to show what Jesus did. 
And in Luke, he wrote to Gentile converts, people who hadn't grown up as Jews, but had converted into the church, and they just kind of wanted the whole story, and he pieced it together more of, as an effective journalist who had gone and done his research and put the homework together and put all, but he had, his purpose was to show that Jesus was the Son of Man, that he was the representative human being for all the nations. And John, when he wrote his, he wrote it his last, and uh, he emphasized what Jesus said. He had the, the point of John was, I'm telling you these things to prove to you that Jesus was God. And he only has six miracles in his gospel. So what sometimes when you want to get the story, you got to piece all four of them together and see what was going on. And it's interesting because you wouldn't know it from the gospel of Mark, but you do realize from the gospel of John, this is not the first time they're meeting Jesus. In fact, flip to John chapter, um, chapter 1. And I think it's page 789 on those brown Bibles. John, we're in Mark, next gospel is Luke, and then after that's John. In John chapter 1, we get a little more backstory before this event occurs. Now, um, it's interesting because in, in Mark it told us that this call was before or after John the Baptist had been put in prison. When he walks by the store and he says, come follow me, it's after John the Baptist is put in prison. But So in John 1, we get this story, starting in verse 35. It says, the next day, John, meaning John the Baptist, was there again with two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following, and he asked, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and I will show, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the 10th hour. Andrew Simon Peter's brother was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which was translated is Peter. Okay, so in the Mark story, Jesus is walking by the shore, and he calls out to Andrew and Simon, and he says, come follow me. And then a little later, he walks down the beach a little further out. There's James and John, sons of Zebedee. He says, you guys come follow me too. They drop everything. Now, here's what's interesting. All that took place after John the Baptist had been put in prison. Here's a story in the Gospel of John that takes place before John the Baptist is put in prison. And in this story, two of the guys are hanging out with John the Baptist because he's doing all the baptizing and he's the prophet on the scene and everybody's following him and listening to his words. And suddenly Jesus walks by and John the Baptist looks up and in, in the equivalent basically says, there goes the Messiah. Now two of his disciples are like, what? And so they leave John the Baptist. They go follow him. Well, one of those guys is Andrew, the same one who in the Mark story is going to be called out of the boat. And Andrew hangs out with Jesus that day. And the first thing he does is he goes and he gets his brother. And he brings his brother Simon to meet Jesus because he's like, hey, I don't know who this guy really is, but John the Baptist just called him the Messiah. He says he's the Lamb of God. So let's go. If John the Baptist thinks he's cool, then we better see who this guy is. So he grabs Simon, takes him over to Jesus, and Jesus looks at him, has one look. He says, you are Simon, but I'm going to call you Rocky. That's really the literal translation. I'm going to call you Rocky, right? So he gets his nickname right there. And so they start hanging out. And you read the rest of John, and then they, they're hanging out. Other things are happening. He's picking up a few more followers. In John chapter 2, there's the wedding at Cana. They're with them. They watch Jesus turn water into wine. Uh, and then uh, in John chapter 3, he, they're back down in Jerusalem. Actually, they, they watch him in the end of chapter 2 go down to Jerusalem with him. He cleanses the temple the first time. And then um, he goes and teaches with Nicodemus. They're hanging out with him. They start going back towards Galilee. He goes through the town of Samaria. He meets the Samaritan woman at the well. All this kind of crazy stuff's going on there in this town of Samaria. And it says in verse 43 of John chapter 4, it says, After the two days he left for Galilee. All of that takes place with Andrew and Simon and James and John and some of the other apostles watching Jesus, hanging out with him, spending time with him. In fact, what's happening is these guys are observing Jesus for some time. And then one day, after having observed Jesus for a while and hanging out with him for a while and watching even that miracle of the wedding was kind of a weird one. You know, I mean, Jesus is doing some stuff. And they're watching him go down to Jerusalem and they're watching him confront the leaders. And then they go back to Galilee. When they get back to Galilee, they go back to business as usual. And they're out there fishing, and they just start fishing. And one day Jesus walks by, and he says, come follow me. And these guys have a sense that now something big is going to change. It's like a calling on their lives. They've observed Jesus. They've seen his person. They've watched his power. But they've been detached from it a little bit. 
They've been sort of outside observance watching things go on. And when Jesus says, come follow me, they have this sense that, oh, this is a moment when something is about to change. And a decision needs to get made. Do I follow him or do I just keep doing what I do and I say, I'll catch up later, Jesus. I'm kind of busy right now. When I get this done, I'll come and I'll catch up with you. And in that moment, all four of these guys in Luke chapter 5, verse 10, tells us they're business partners. That Andrew and Simon and James and John, they were all, they were all business partners. They had this fleet of, of uh, fishing boats they held together. Their dads had started it. They had hired men who could manage the boats. These were successful fishermen. I don't know if you ever got the idea that these are just a bunch of old goats and bib overalls out there, <laughs> casting a rod, you know, catching. You know, and those were Jesus' apostles. No, these guys were super successful businessmen who owned a fleet of fishing boats that had hired crews to them. And in this moment, it's like, drop everything, leave the business, come follow me. It's a weird moment because oftentimes a lot of us are that same thing. We sort of come around Jesus and around Christianity and around the things and we observe it for a while. We sort of checking it out and see what's going on. But the question comes, when does it ever penetrate your own heart? When does it become real to you? When are you actually crossing a threshold and you say, well, now I'm a Christian. And as a Christian, maybe Jesus is calling some different things from me. When I, um, years ago, worked in a seeker-driven church down in California, and that meant that Sunday service was an outreach event for people who do not believe. And so what we did is we would package an entire church service, and we would base that whole church service on, oh, we'd have a theme like, I don't know, anger, or, you know, one of the seven deadly sins might be a series or something. And what would happen is there'd always be one song off the top that was a worship song, and then everybody sat down, and we would do a rip, rip and cool performance song. We would do, if it was a Beatles tune or Rolling Stones tune that was needed, we would do that. There would always be a drama skit that proposed the question, never solved the answer. And then another song, real brief, entertaining announcements, great video clips, and then a very entertaining sermon that was pitched to people on this idea of what does God have to say to you about anger, and then um, service would end and out it would go, and we would actually have meetings in between, and the service was so tight that it would be like we'd meet in the green room, all 25 of us would put the church on, and the program director would say stuff like, well, that first service was two minutes too long, so we've got to cut a verse out of the chorus, we've got to speed the announcements, don't have that, clean this up, clean that up, I mean, it was a show. Guys with headsets saying, you know, okay, cue the pulpit right now, bring the pulpit up and close the curtains and lights get ready. One, two, three, go, lights up. It was, a, it was that kind of thing. And when I first went to it, what got me was like people would come to this church and it boomed, it worked. It was a, it was, I would say later, it was, it was a church on steroids, right? We found, this, we found this steroid that we could just take, which would bring a massive amount of people quickly because we were the greatest show in town. And uh, what bothered me, for a long time when I first went there, is how people could attend church every week for six months, eight months, a year, a year and a half, and never become Christians. And I was thinking, well, something's wrong with this. Are we, do we actually doing what we think we're doing? Are we accomplishing what we are, think we're accomplishing? Is this, is this really working? And, and so we would have a lot of these dialogues behind the scenes. And I think in, in retrospect, it was kind of my fault. I was coming from a background where it's like you did an altar call every Sunday, right? And so people would come to church, you'd give out a message, and folks got saved at the altar call. Come on down, and we'll pray over you, and bam, boom, bam, your first time in church, you walk away a Christian. And I had had that experience in my teen years. Truth is, that's a really rare experience. The more common experience is people start hearing about Jesus. They start investigating Christianity. They start watching Christians who they know. They read a book or two. They might dabble in reading a passage here and there. They might attend a Bible study. The truth is, people don't really come to Christ in this magic moments where it's like, I walked in the door, I'd never heard of God before, preacher was powerful, spirit was in the room, they gave an altar call and I got saved. It does happen to people. But the more common experience is people begin a process of investigating Jesus, hanging out with Him, hanging out with His people, listening to His words, and then suddenly one day, poof, a light goes on. And they're like, I get it now. It's a story is told of a guy named John Wesley. He was one of the greatest preachers in the history of the world, really. We'd have to say that. He was responsible for one of the, uh, the Great Awakening. In the American colonial days, there was a spiritual revival that took place in Britain and in the United States of America. It was largely carried on the backs of three powerful preachers, George Whitfield, John Wesley, Jonathan Edwards. And those three guys were profound preachers, and the Spirit of God went out and began to transform and change society. Orphanages were, were built. Laws were changed. Labor laws were changed. A, a, all of society began to react to this injustice that they felt. And uh, in fact, looking back, historians would say one reason that Britain never went through a bloody revolution the way the French did is because a spiritual awakening had taken place in the 1700s and uh, they had a cultural revolution that came from the mind and the hearts of people because God was at work. 
And John Wesley was one of the main agents of the First Great Awakening. But he started off different. He had gone to Oxford University to become a pastor. And while he was there, he created a little holiness club that everybody made fun of him because he was all super, you know, oh, you think you're holy? Oh, great. And so in those uh, days, the Anglican Church controlled the colonies in America. And the Anglican Church was a state church. So if you wanted a pastor job, it was actually a government appointment, like being a post office general or something. And so they would appoint you to a church and they would take you. He got appointed to a church in Savannah, Georgia. So they sent John Wesley down there, and he, he does a little ministry for a while as a young man in Savannah, Georgia, at the, in the colony of Georgia, and he's not doing very well. He doesn't preach very good. He falls in love with his girl. She rejects him, so he decides not to serve her communion because he says, you're a flighty little thing. Her dad is very powerful in the town, and he gets him ousted out of the position and booted out of town, sent on a ship, and back to England you go. We don't need your sorry carcass here. Get Ross, John Wesley. On the way home in the ship, they encounter a huge storm. And the storm is so powerful that even the sailors on the ship are fearing for their lives. And they've been in a lot of storms, but they know this one they're going to go down. Everybody's panicking on the boat, except this group of Germans, Moravians they were called from that, that province. And they're just sitting there totally at peace, just relaxed and just praying. And he's like, what, what's going on with you guys? And they're like, our lives are in the hands of Jesus. We, we don't have any concern whether we live or die. It's all cool. We're, we're good. We're good. We're at peace with Jesus. And later in his diaries, John and Wesley would write, he would say, something was missing. Here I was, the official chaplain of the church, the appointed pastor, Oxford trained. I had been all of these things. I was an ordained minister, and I was panicked for my own life, and I could have cared less about everybody else on the ship. And this group of German Moravians just sat there in total peace, and I knew whatever it is they understood about God was something completely different than what I understood about him. Obviously, the ship didn't go down. They made it through the storm. They pull into port. And John Wesley comes up to him and he says, tell me, what is it you have? How could you do that? And they were just relaxed. They were like, they, one of them turns to him and says, well, don't you know Jesus is your Savior? He says, I know Jesus is the Savior. They said, no, no, not the Savior. That's an academic, intellectual mindset. That's a title you have given him. I'm asking you, don't you know Jesus as your personal Savior who has saved you from your sins? Don't you have a relationship with him? To which John Wesley was so taken back, he couldn't even answer the question. But it haunted him. A little bit later on, he decides to go to one of the meetings of these Moravians, and they're holding these worship services in the Aldersgate Cathedral there in London, and he, he wanders in, and he, he's un, he doesn't even want to be there. He would write in his diary, he was sort of like being dragged against his will, but nobody was with him. His heart was making him go. He wanted to see, what is it these guys understand? And he went into this church service, and there something happened where he encountered Jesus for the first time in a real way. He says, he'll say, my heart was richly and warmly stirred. And suddenly sitting there, I had this absolute confidence that Jesus was with me and that he had saved me from my sins and my life was going to be all right. I placed it in his hands. And in that moment, after years of study, after years of being a chaplain, after years of being ordained, after even being a minister, he gets saved by Jesus Christ. And he would become one of the greatest orators in the history of Christianity. He would write sermons that are still studied today. He would travel on horseback. He had this huge booming voice. And he would just ride all across the United States and all across England on horseback, stand up in a town square and just start preaching. And people by the thousands came to hear him. One of the most influential people who would ever live. And I think sometimes our lives are a little bit like that. That we're following Jesus, but there are these moments that arrive that I'll call them a moment of higher calling where we think we got it, you know, I, I'm in, I'm in with the people, I'm in with the crowd. But then you have this moment when you realize, you know, the, the church doesn't get me there. It isn't the church that's going to take me to heaven. It, it isn't the group I associate with. It isn't my theological camp or my denominational tribe. That's not what's actually going to do it for me. At some point, I have to have this encounter with Jesus where I get to stand alone and say, yes, he's my savior. I was re recently talking to some guys who were um, heading up a a facility for it's a drug and alcohol rehab with Christian principles and values. And they bring these fellows in and they have them for like a year, year and a half. And uh, there's this huge attrition rate at the end when these guys graduate. Not a lot of them are still standing and walking a clean and sober life with Jesus later. And the dialogue we had was it's very hard to tell in those kinds of settings when someone gets clean and sober in an environment where they're living with and uh, spending their time with all other people who are really reinforcing their Christianity 
whether or not the individual person really has an experience with Jesus. And the only way to know is to take that ember out of the fire and set it aside and see if it can glow on its own. And take a person who's with the group and hanging out and learning everything they need to know and take them out of the group for a short time and have them stand on their own and see if their fire still glows. Then you know whether or not you got the real deal and whether your own life is on fire or whether you're just being warmed by the fires of the group. And we had that dialogue because sometimes that attrition rate's huge. A lot of people put the faith in the group. And when there comes a time, and by the way, Jesus will do this with all of us. He will remove us from a church. He will remove us from an organization. He will remove us to have a stand on our own so that he can show us and we can show him who we really are in relationship to him. A lot of people in the room can say, I've been burned by a church. I left for a long time. It's like, yeah, yeah, a lot of us can say that. You know what? Jesus did that to you on purpose. Because he didn't want you following a man. He didn't want you following a preacher. He didn't want you following a church denomination. He didn't want you following a church name. He wanted you following him. So he had something go bad in that situation to remove you from it so that you could see whether or not you stand alone with your own relationship with him. And some of us did pretty well, and some of us said, ah, man, I just tanked after that. It's like, well, that's, that's the point. Jesus is trying to show us how strong we really are. Whether we've had that moment of higher calling. I did, a, I did a funeral yesterday in this room right back here with one of my favorite street guys. His name was Scott. Beam me up, Scotty Warren. Beam me up was his street name. And I liked him. Old guy. He was my age, but he looked more like he was 84. And uh, he'd, his life had been hard. And I was meeting with his family. And in a weird kind of coincidence, I knew him from coming to our meals. He had twinkling blue eyes, great smile, generous heart, great attitude all the time. And I knew him from our meals. And then we had this couple who was friends with um, some other people who used to attend our church, Lindsay and Tyler Robinson. Um, And this couple had come to church several times. And it turns out that this one girl, Rachel, is the niece of Scotty. And I'm like, I had no idea you guys were related. No idea that this homeless guy who used to eat in our church all the time was related to this girl who would occasionally attend our church. And so when we did the funeral, I sat down and I said, well, what, tell me about his life. She says, well, he left when he was 18 years old to ride the rails because he was going to preach Jesus to all the hobos. That was his life's goal. I'm just going to, and it was, would have been 1979. He was the same age as me. I'm like, oh, I remember Larry Norman was singing songs about how Jesus was going to come back any minute now. And late great planet Earth was out. And how Lindsay, and everybody was telling us, Russia, the big bear of North is going to invade Israel and the world's about to end. We all knew that, right? If you're around the 70s, following Christianity. So in 1979, he leaves to go ride the rails as a hobo to tell everybody about Jesus because that was the call on his life. But at 54, he would die as a meth addict of liver failure and kidney failures in the streets as a homeless guy. I, I, don't, I don't know how to process that for me. Part of me wants to say, Scotty, I don't know if you had the real thing. And the other part of me says, once Jesus gets a hold of you, he has you. But if you don't continually surrender to Jesus, life trajectory ends up different than what Jesus would have for you. And I wrestle with that. But, you know, he started off good, started off with great intention. It's interesting to see where he ends up, because I think in Scotty's life, as long with all of us, are these moments of higher calling where the voice of Jesus comes and says, follow me. And sometimes we do, and sometimes we say, sorry, Jesus, that's too risky. That's too hard. I'm too busy. Uh, call me later. When I, let me resolve this thing first. And the moments pass us by. It's interesting because... Uh, John chapter 12, verse 25, there's this crazy passage that a lot of guys wrestle with. I wrestle with it. drives me nuts. Chapter 12, verse 25 of the Gospel of John. I'm back up to chapter or verse 23 of chapter 12. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Interesting passage, tough passage. It's one of those passages where Jesus is basically saying, if you want to hang on to your life, if you want ultimate fulfillment, happiness, joy, contentment, you better let go of everything, of all your own personal ambitions. Let go of them. Lose it all for my sake, and I will give you a life that's worth living. And that is hard to do. Super hard. It's been said, and I believe it, that salvation is a free gift that will cost you everything. It's true. 
The gift of God is free for anyone who wants it. But once you enter in, Jesus says, oh, by the way, he's not shy about saying, I'm asking you for everything you are and you have and you ever will be on his terms. One commentator uh, wrote a book called Stumbling on God about the Gospel of Mark. And he made this comment. He says, the, world, the word disciple implies both following and learning. To be a disciple in the sense used in the Gospel of Mark, it requires not only a release from human attachments and possessions to follow a new way of life, but also a release from conventional attitudes and concepts to understand in a new way in order to discover the mystery of God's kingdom. Another commentator said, Jesus' calls is to a task. It's not to ease, but to service. A task in which the disciples would have to spend themselves and burn themselves up and in the end die for his sake and the sake of the fellow men. A person follows Jesus not because of anything Christ said, but because of all that he is. It's falling in love. Years ago, I won this uh, scholarship to Multnomah School of the Bible, and I would go to get a grad degree. And... uh, I, was, I thought I would be a Christian musician. That's what I wanted to do. But as I explored the music industry more, I realized I wasn't very smart theologically or biblically. And I needed to learn some things. So I win this scholarship. Off I go to Multnomah School of the Bible and took this one class from this little old man who was one of the founders of the school. He was 96 years old and still teaching theology. And uh, old Scottish guy, wonderful storyteller, and uh, just in love with Jesus. And every time we would gather in the class, he would either start the class or end the class every day with this phrase. He would say, let me ask you, class, are you falling in love with a Savior? And we would all be like, isn't that cute little old man? Isn't he something? Little old guy just wants us to love Jesus. Man, he's so cute. And uh, as time wore on, though, he became this incredible mantra who would reawaken something. Because you see, we're in the middle of, we're studying, we're taking classes in depth and deep theology, and we're, we're writing papers, and we're reading books, and we're, we're taking classes in missiology, and we're taking classes in philosophy, and all this religion and doctrine, and, and talking and arguing and discussing all these concepts. And every now and then, you needed the wake-up call, and that multitude of knowledge pouring into your mind, some little voice would say, let me ask you, are you fallen in love with a Savior? And there were many times it would be like, oh, Well, is that what we're doing this for? And you know what? Sometimes church life is like that. We can set up tables and chairs and rehearse songs and do a kid's ministry and join a small group and be in a Bible study and attend all the church functions and do this stuff. And suddenly you get overwhelmed because it's always happening and happening, ushering and greeting and getting this done and that done and making coffee and all this kind of thing. And let me ask you, church, are you fallen in love with a Savior? Or is it just duty, obligation, and chore? And somehow in all of this is like, I know Jesus is in it and I know he's moving and I sense people are getting touched. But me personally, am I falling in love with the Savior personally? That's a profound question each of us needs to ask. Because if not, in all of this that we're doing, something powerful and profound and meaningful and significant. In fact, I would say the only thing that matters is missing. Good point for all of us to stop and say, whoa, Jesus. I committed my life to you a long time ago, and I said I would follow you. I tried to lose my life for your sake, and even now I'm trying to do it. But am I falling in love with you? That's a great question, and probably we won't answer it in this moment. It'll be one of those moments when you're like, the apostles like, watch him at Cana, watch him cleanse the temple, watch him, and then soon, soon in your life, you'll hear the voice of Jesus come to you in some way, shape, or form, and you'll hear him say, hey, whatever it is you got going today, blow it off and follow me. And in that moment, you're really being asked, are you falling in love with a Savior? Let's pray. Lord, this is our heartbeat. Uh, We don't want to just be intellectual people who study a Bible and have it all in our mind and lose it all in our hearts. And we don't want to be people who follow a group or a herd or a doctrine or a church or a denomination. We want to be people who hang tightly under the hand of our Savior, that whatever the storms of life bring, whatever the joys of life bring, we can say, Jesus led me through it, or Jesus brought me to it. Jesus, we ask that uh, our hearts get awakened with love and passion. And Lord, in each of our moments, and it will be a different call for every one of us, for you have called us differently, when we hear your voice, and we hear you call out to us, and we hear it, it would just be a whisper saying, come, follow me, that the love in our heart will be such that we will drop our very lives and we will follow you. Give us that strength and give us that understanding and give us that power and give us that affection. Lord, you said in your word that you are at work in us both to will and to do for your good pleasure. So Lord, give us that. We ask in your name. And then may we be the ones who can say, that's my king. I wonder, do you know him? In your name, amen.
God bless you guys. And hang out for a little bit. Say hi to somebody you don't know. Make a friend. Introduce yourself. Thanks for coming to the gathering house.